baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Thank you. Praise God. Praise the Lord tonight for His goodness. Let God arise and His enemies be scattered. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is certainly here. The presence of God is certainly here in a great way. Thank God for His goodness. How the hand of the Lord has moved and ministered night after night. I thank God for that. I feel in the Holy Ghost tonight that there's some victory that is specific that needs to be won in the Spirit. And within the next few minutes, we will have a visitation of the Holy Ghost. And God will move in this place. And there are devils that know that and would like to interfere. But by the blood of Calvary and the name of Jesus, there is the overcoming power of Almighty God in this place tonight. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank God! Thank God! Thank God! That's right. The devil does not want us in the presence of God. For in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. And the devil does not want us in the presence of God. In the presence of God, our praise turns to worship. And when we worship God in spirit and in truth, there's a union between flesh and spirit. And that is something that the devil can never, ever experience and will would love to interfere with, but he cannot. Amen. Praise God for His presence here tonight. There is a very subtle difference between praise and worship. Very, very subtle difference between praise and worship. It has to do with our focus. It has to do with what we see. Basically, we spend most of our time being very, very self-absorbed, very self-centered. We are very self-aware of problems. We are self-aware of situations. We are concerned with them because we know that we'll have to face them. We have to deal with them. And so we concern ourselves with them to the point that that usually becomes the center of all of our attention. You can praise God in that state of being, in that frame of mind. You can praise God and it is an acceptable praise. But somewhere, every now and then, one person or a group of people continue in the presence of God and praise until finally you get into His presence. And when you come into the presence of God, something changes. You cease to be self-absorbed and you become absorbed in Him. You forget about yourselves, as the Course says, and you begin to concentrate on Him. And when you do that, our praise turns to worship. Let me say it another way. I can praise nice things. And I use the words praise and worship figuratively here, but you can praise lovely things, things that you like. You can praise them and not be in their presence. You can come to this place tonight and go and tell your friend the awesome things you saw today, and you can praise them. You can tell your friends what you've seen, and the majesty of it, and the beauty of it, and the glory of it, and not be looking at it. But oh, when you get there and you're actually looking at the beauty of that, there's something about it that is, that's incredible. It's incredible. I, I've told people about many things that I've seen, but, and uh, I I've, I've, was told about a lot of things, but when I got in their presence, 
words fail. You don't want to jabber and ramble and rattle on about it. You ever been in museums? Go to museums? And they're not running around stuffing popcorn in their mouth in a museum. It's almost a reverent thing. Everybody's walking softly. It's just a museum. It's just paintings and pictures and, and old artifacts and things under glass. But, but it's incredible. We, we talk about it. I visited a museum in Memphis when they brought um, some of the mummies from Egypt and laid them out there. I talked about mummies. We had joked about it. You, you know how you do, but everybody was walking around that mummy like they didn't want to wake it up. They, they would move quickly to the edge of the glass and they'd be careful how they touched it and they'd look at it and they'd whisper things to each other. I went uh, and saw one of the Pharaoh's jewelry displays that came. They brought it on the world tour and I, I, we went in there and saw earrings made of solid gold that looked like it would break someone's neck. People weren't running around talking about it and excited and saying, Oh, that's awesome, man. Did you see that over there in the other room? Wow, you ought to go. Nobody was doing that. They were just kind of shuffling around, just ooh and an ah. Right. There's a difference when you actually see it. There's a subtle difference between praise and worship. There is a power in the presence of God and the devil would like for you to stay out of his presence tonight because if you ever get in the presence of God, something's going to happen to that heart of yours. Something is going to happen in that brain of yours if you ever get in the presence of God. And I pray tonight that before we leave this place, we will all have the opportunity at least to get into the presence of God. And something happen in the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. Lord, I love you and I thank you for your presence. I bless the sweet name of Jesus in this auditorium tonight. Thank you for this Friday night. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for everybody that came to church tonight. Thank you for all of the effort that was put forth to be here tonight, to come to this place tonight. I ask you, God, to just touch our hearts with your spirit tonight. Open the doors and lead us. Lead everything we say and do into the presence of God tonight. Help us to come into your presence. In the name of Jesus, would you just lift your hands to the Lord. Close your eyes and, and begin to open your heart to the move of God. Everybody, I wonder what would happen if everybody in the room would do this. know I do not know if we have all of his notes but they did it like this in the book of Acts they got the Holy Ghost and then Peter preached yes I don't know how long he took it doesn't take long to read his sermon but I don't think we have all of his notes I, I think that's a summary. <laughs> Praise God. I'll preach 30 minutes if you'll stay with me now. Now, if you won't think it's all over and go home in your brain. That's right. Or go to Denny's in your spirit. If you'll stay with me just a few more minutes. See, because I know that there's some other needs here. There's a young lady here that needs the Holy Ghost. There's a young man that needs desperately the touch of God. You tried it twice tonight, and you just kind of bummed out on it because you don't feel it. But it's all right. Thank you for trying. You're going to have it yet. Praise God. Eddie got his, and others are going to get theirs tonight. Praise God. Praise God. In James chapter 1 and verse 24... 
I read a text tonight. I, I begin reading at verse 21 of James chapter 1. If you have your Bibles and want to read with me, that's fine. If you don't, trust that I'm going to read it right. In James chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Praise God. You may be seated tonight. I want to preach to you some things the devil would like you to forget. I am convinced that the devil spends 24 hours a day when we wake and when we sleep. I am convinced that he spends 24 hours a day dedicating himself to helping us forget some things. If we can forget them, it's going to do some things to the kingdom of God very naturally. He won't have to work. He won't have to make drunks out of anybody. He won't have to introduce drugs. He won't have to tear the church up with immorality if the church will just forget a few things. He'll accomplish the same purpose if the church would just conveniently forget a few things. You don't have to be sinners. You don't have to let sin come into the church. You can stay squeaky clean and it's fine with the devil. He'll even help you stay squeaky clean, but just forget a few things. Because after all, it will accomplish the same purpose. And so much the better if it doesn't tax his kingdom. And it doesn't raise an eyebrow. And it doesn't bother anybody. So if you can forget a few things tonight, go ahead and be the church. Go ahead and worship. Go ahead and praise. Go ahead and sing. Go ahead and pay your tithe. Go ahead and give. Go ahead and cooperate. Go ahead and buy a coupon for the picture tonight. Do all of that. Do it all. But just, if you will, forget a few things. Forget, first of all, the power of the Word of God. Please forget that. It would help the devil so much if you would, for a, a, just a little while, lose track of the idea that the Word of God is awesomely powerful. That the Word of God will judge all of us. That we are bound by the Word and to the Word. Forget that, if you will. Forget the Word of God. Memorize anything you want, but don't memorize the Word. Let anything come to mind in your hour of darkness, but don't let it be Scripture. Don't let it be the Word of God in your hour of trouble and tribulation. Let anything come to your mind with hope or despair or gloom or sunshine or whatever, but don't let the Word of God come to mind because the Word of God is quick, which in the Bible means alive. It is alive. It is not ink on paper. It is alive. It's moving. It has personality. It has power. It has direction. It has will. It has purpose. It can go where nothing else can go. The Word of God is not a thing, it's a who. It's not a thing, it's a who. That's right. That's good. It is the emanation of God that became all things in creation. David understood the power of the Word of God. He dedicated the entire 119th Psalm, the longest Psalm in the Word of God. He dedicated it to the power and the glory of just the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. You hide the Word in your heart. And it, it acts like a buffer and a shield against the things of sin. Nothing will so undermine the power of a temptation like the power of the Word of God. Nothing will put the devil on the run like a quick scripture that knows and establishes the Word of God. Right? The Word of God is cleansing. 
It is more cleansing than any soap, any detergent this world could ever know. The Word of God is cleansing. A uh, tide can't get as deep in the fabric of life as the Word can. The Word goes deep among the fibers of life and cleanses it out. Cleanses out sin. Cleanses the character like that. That is, that is a horrible extreme. And I've met very, very few people that I believe were really reprobate. But I've met a scores and scores of people who had trouble having faith that God would do what He said. Yes. Timothy encountered some people like this. They moaned and whined about their sin. Oh, they'd come to church, but they would drag and belabor everything. You couldn't preach faith. You couldn't preach anything that would lift them up. They were down and out about everything. They had sinned. Some of them had backslidden. They had known God and, and backslidden, gone back to some of the things of the world and then come back and had the same lament that I've heard so many times in my ministry. It's not the same as it was before. I don't feel as good as I did the first time around. I've seen people give up and go back in sin because when they came back to God after backsliding, they didn't feel the way they used to feel. Timothy was having trouble with people like that and he wrote to Paul. He said, what do I do about it? He said, uh, I, I've got to know what to tell them. Paul said, there's nothing to tell them. But he said they need to subject themselves to the Word of God. That they would sit down and subject themselves to the Word of God. He said, if peradventure, God would give and grant them repentance. Something has to work in the Spirit of God and it can only work by the Word of God. There's not enough hours in the day that this man could counsel you over your problems and your troubles. Much of problems of life and struggles with life can be tended to if you just learn to be faithful to the house of God. Come sit on a pew and let the preacher preach to you. Because the Word of God is quick and it's powerful. And it can reach where the words of man cannot reach. And it will cleanse you and it will help you and it will bring repentance. Right. The Word of God is cleansing. That's why if the devil wants to get you, the first thing he'll do is get you out from under the influence of the Word of God. Right. Somebody starts getting cold in the Lord and they get disgruntled with the preacher. Usually that's the first thing that happens. And it doesn't really have to be anything important to be disgruntled with the preacher about. But the devil has that wrench that he likes to throw in the cogs of the whole work every now and then. And he'll toss it if you let him. He'll toss it. And the first thing that you will do is get mad at the preacher. You don't get mad at your doctor. You don't get mad at your lawyer. You don't get mad at those people, but this man's going to save your soul by the preaching of the Word of God with a burden that God has laid on his heart. So if the devil wants to get you, the first thing he's going to do is get your wires crossed with this man. That'll put you out of the house of God and you'll stay home and you won't come to church. Right. And the devil's making a heyday of it and making a fool of you. Because he's taking you out from under the influence of the Word of God. And in doing so, you have no cleansing. You have no strengthening. You have no life that comes to you. Paul told Timothy, he said, get those people to get to church and sit on a pew. If they're mad, disgruntled, whatever, get them on a pew and preach to them. And let them be subjected to the Word of God. Because the Word of God will bring repentance into their life. It may not happen the first time or the second time or two dozen times, but you'll be sitting here one night and the preacher will feel the anointing of God and God will say something through him and it will strike a spark in your heart, deep in your soul, and the wells of life will break open again and you will feel the touch of God in your heart in a brand new way and there will come a visitation of the Holy Ghost to your spirit. But it must happen by the power of the Word of God. Yeah. And if the devil's going to get you, he'll get you by getting you out from under the presence and the influence of the Word of God. I say preach to me. Preach to me. Yeah. The most dangerous position in my life is when I don't want anybody to preach to me. Yeah. I need somebody.
somebody to preach to me. And the less I feel like it, then obviously the more I need it. And if I have to sit on the front row and say, Preacher, take a text on me if you will. Then preach to me because there is a power in the Word of God that nothing else will do. Sliding the name of God, we know that name and we love that name. But he was putting the Word in perspective. And he was showing us the awesome power of the Word of God and how eternal it is. You see, in its effect, and understand what I'm saying if I go slow here tonight, in its effect uh, a little bit, the name of Jesus Christ is not eternal as we know it. Now, you're going to get quiet because you're going to listen to me. There is no other name given among men. That's the first qualification. Among men. The second qualification is under heaven. Whereby we must be saved. When salvation is consummated... When there's no more issue of salvation, when nobody's lost and nobody's saved, the name of Jesus becomes all in all. You read about that in Corinthians. That everything is turned over to God that He might be all in all. He said there is coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. All right, someday, and I'll put that in modern language, someday that means there's not going to be another issue about Godhead. Someday it's all going to be settled. Men can jaw and argue and yak about it all they want in this world, but someday God said, it's all right, it'll go full cycle, and every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Every, Every Buddhist, every Krishna... Every atheist, every agnostic, every communist, every every denomination from every walk of life, every single one of them will bow. Every lost person will bow. Every saved person will bow. Everybody's going to bow and say, you are right. Yes, that's right. They're going to know that there is one and his name is one. There's not going to be anybody in heaven running around saying uh hello hello jesus uh where's the others (laughs) those who live their lives in this world thinking that the godhead was a corporation those that thought the godhead was one building with three offices And in the big office behind the oak panel doors where nobody went unless you went through two or three secretaries was God the Father. He was the big one. And on his right, down the hall, was a smaller office, very nice, but smaller office, of the Son. And uh, that... When God got ready to save people, of course, He said, Well, I can't do this, but I love them so much. Yes, Father. Son, I love the world so much that I would like for you to go and die for them, if you will. Yes, Father. And so Jesus comes and dies, and then they say, Well, then the third person. And that third person bugs me. Nobody can explain to me the third person in the Godhead. Nobody has ever been able to describe the person. They describe the person of God the Father. He's an old man with white hair and a white beard. That's as close as they can get to his person. And they say, well, uh, the person of the Son is obvious. But when it comes to that third person of the Holy Ghost, they have a little problem. Because as close as they've ever come is a bird. They, they can't get past that bird cage. But, they're, but they, they, somebody's got to come up with something if it's a separate person. If the Holy Spirit, if there's a spirit separate from the Spirit of God, somebody's got to put Him in a person because they say that He's a separate person. So Jesus came and died and then went back to heaven, got back in His office and sat down at the right hand of God, and then He buzzed on the intercom 
the third person. Excuse me, Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost fluttered. Would you please go down to the earth and fill them uh, with your spirit? Now we're laughing about it, but it just makes about that much sense to say there are three persons in a Godhead. God is not a corporation. He is one, and His name is one. The most simplest thing to believe and understand is exactly what the Scripture bears out, and that is that there is one God, and He is Spirit. Not a Spirit, but He is Spirit. That there is no limit to Him. There's nowhere you can go that God is not. And you got to quit thinking about the Spirit of God as a person. He is not a person. He is Spirit. Jesus told the woman at the well, God is Spirit. The King James translator stuck a little A in there, but it wasn't in there. Jesus said, God is spirit. Where, whither shall I go? David said that you're not there. I know I'm past my 30 minutes, but I'll quit. I'll quit in just a few minutes. Whither can I go that thou art not? He said, though I make my bed in hell, you'll be there. If you can find a place anywhere in God's heaven that God is not, then I'll accept that he is a person. Is there anywhere that you can run out of God and have to get back in God? Then He's limited. But we are taught that He is omnipresent. He's everywhere. God is Spirit. There's only one Spirit. And Spirit manifested itself in flesh. And they say, well, where did that flesh come from? He borrowed it from a woman. They say, well, God the Son came from heaven. He came from a woman. And Jesus, and, and, and when the Holy Ghost was promised, they were puzzled. They said, oh, please don't ever, ever leave us. Don't leave us again. He had gone away, but now he said, well, i got to go. It's expedient, he said, for you that I go away. I I have to. If I go not away, the Comforter, which the Father will send in my name, cannot come. Cannot. But if there's three persons, you could be here right along with the Spirit. No. It's, It's, I have to go away. If I don't go away, the Comforter can't come. He had already explained to them, why? Because I'm with you now. Would you rather me be in this form of the flesh and be with you? Or would you rather me be glorified and come back in the spirit form and be in you? I am with you now, but I shall be in you. He referred to himself as the spirit of truth. One spirit. One spirit. It's the simplest thing to see it and understand it and have that revelation. It's the most marvelous thing. Someday that's all. Everybody's going to have that revelation. Someday they're going to get to heaven and there's only going to be one throne. And on the throne is going to sit Jesus Christ. And they're not going to look at him as God the Son. They're going to know he's God. To the glory of God the Father, they're going to say, oh, oh, I see it now. I understand. Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody. So all those in hell will not be staggering around worrying about how many gods there are. They're going to know. They're going to know who judged them. They're going to know who fa- who they failed. They're going to know who they disobeyed. They're going to know all of that. There's not going to be any question. Everybody in heaven's going to know who sits on the throne. Not going to be any puzzlement about, well, I wonder where the birdcage is, and I wonder where the other throne is. No, Nobody's going to worry about that. They're all going to know that there is the city of God, and He is in the midst of that city, and the Lamb is the light. They're just going to know that. So the name of Jesus will be once and for all established and settled forever. And not, we're not going to... What David was trying to say is that we're not going to treat the name of Jesus as the saving name anymore because that issue is settled. That was given among men on earth. 
under heaven for salvation. That's all consummated now. Now he is all in all. Let's get on with the other business. And the other business is that the word of God is still going on. The rapture doesn't stop God from speaking. And judgment doesn't quit make God quit talking. And uh, heaven does not silence God. John said there was a lot of things going to happen after heaven was uh, finished and hell was closed and time was no more that God was going to keep on creating, keep on speaking. The Word of God was going to continue. And the Word of God will hold all of eternity together and keep eternity on track. That's why David understood that. He understood, Thou hast exalted thy word even above thy name. When the name issue is settled, the word issue is going to go on and on and on and on and on forever. The devil would like you to forget that. He would like you to forget the power of the word. He would like for you to forget that the promises of God cannot fail. Can not fail. They are in Him, yea and amen. They are signed, sealed, and delivered. He would like for you to forget that. In 1 Kings, they, they lauded the Word of God. They, they wanted to praise God. So as they were praising God and worshiping God, they were trying to think, now what can we say about God? And what can we say about Him that is, that is so unique above all that man does? What can we say that puts God above everything in man? And then they stopped and said, oh, I got it. There has not failed one word of all He promised. <laughs> And that praise elevated him above everything that man could do. Oh, the devil is a liar. Jesus said the truth isn't in him. The devil couldn't tell the truth if he knew the truth. He couldn't tell it. Jesus said the truth isn't in him. Why do you worry about what the devil said? Why are you worried about what the devil says? It's not true. It can't be true. But the truth isn't in him. But there has not one word failed of all that God said. Not one word. Not one word. Paul said in Romans chapter 4 that Abram was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. So much that he considered not the deadness of his own body. When God told Abram, you're going to have a child. Abram didn't stop and figure it out. Say, well, now wait a minute here. Uh, you got to understand the age factor here. It did not matter. The word of God was higher than his circumstances. The Word of God superseded everything. He just understood the power of the Word of God to roll back time, to move time forward, to freeze time in its place. He just understood that. And when God said it, it just didn't matter. He did not consider the things. I want to get there. I want to get where when the Word of God goes forth, I don't consider what I'm in and what's going on around me. I just know it's going to happen. It's going to be that way. The devil would like for you to forget the power of the Word of God. I've got to cut to the chase tonight. I've got several things, but I'm, I want to finish this tonight. The devil would like for you and I to forget that we are the church of the living God. The devil would like for us to forget that. He would like for us to forget where we came from. He would like for us to forget where we came from. He would like for us to forget our purpose in the world. We are cleansed from sin. Peter said that we are a royal priesthood, a, a peculiar people, a chosen generation, a holy nation, that we should show forth the praises of Him that called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Show forth His praises. The devil would like you to forget that. He would like you to forget that. Peter said there's a process of spiritual growth that happens to you when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 
He talked about a spiritual process that happened to those that walk with God. And he said, these things make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The devil doesn't have to make winos out of the church to get the church to be unfruitful. He doesn't have to get the church filled with drugs and alcohol and booze and fornication and sin and adultery. He doesn't have to do that to get the church to dry up and die. All he's got to do is keep interfering with the growth process of spirituality that Peter mentions in chapter 1 of his epistle. All he's got to do is get you to forget. And, And Peter said there's a way that he does that. He that lacketh these things is blind. And hear what I'm saying. And cannot see afar off. And here's the part that gets a little ticky. And has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. The devil would like you to get the Holy Ghost, get real comfortable, and live for God long enough till you forget where you came from in God. Forget what your heart was like when you came to God. Forget the sin that God dug you out of. Forget the pit. Forget all of that. Get real comfortable in God. Get so comfortable in God that it, you draw a line with four walls and say, it's us and them. It's the good and the bad. Forget that. Forget that you were purged from your old sin. Forget what you were when God found you. Forget that. That way you'll get haughty. You'll get proud. You'll judge others. You'll get temperamental. You'll get extremely bored in your walk with God and church will become a chore. And in order to keep it exciting, you'll start finding fault in the church. And you'll start fussing and fighting and bickering and you'll get bitter and and all of that business will happen just to keep a little excitement in the church. And you will die spiritually as well as killing other people spiritually. One of the worst faults of the Pharisees, Jesus said, not only will you not go in, but you forbid others to go in. Well, glory. The devil would like for you to forget what you were when God found you. That way you won't love sinners. He wants you to forget what you were when God got a hold of your heart. That way you won't empathize with somebody else that staggers through the door and needs God. That way you can roll up your windows and crank up your gospel tape and turn on the air conditioner and drive blindly by the thousands of needs that swarm around you every day because you're saved. And the same work is accomplished that it would take the devil years and, and a lot of problems to do. And yet he gets the job done by just helping you forget what you were when God found you. If you ever remember what it was like to be in sin, what it was like to be lost, if you ever remember that, a fire is going to start in your heart. You'll get mad at the devil. You will get absolutely mad at the devil to think that he made you do that. And it will dawn on you that he's doing it to other people and you really will get mad. So please forget what you were when God found you. He wants you to forget that you are the only thing that God created eternal. He would like for you to forget about hell and he would like for you to forget most of all about heaven. He wants you to forget about heaven because he's not going there. He'd like for you to forget that this world really isn't your home. It really is not your home. He'd like for you to get so comfortable in this world that it after all becomes a pretty good place to live. Not so bad anymore. He'd like for you to relegate the suffering and the trial to years gone by. He'd like for you to be comfortable with padded pews and air conditioning and nice facilities. 
living for God that becomes popular, very popular. A few years ago, if people knew you talked in tongues, they would think you're crazy. Now it's popular to talk in tongues. Because in the 60s and 70s, we became an experience-oriented generation. When people started toking and smoking and tripping out, everybody was seeking the ultimate experience. Experience. People were copping out of society by the hundreds of thousands and moving out here and moving out east and, and living in communes, all looking for the ultimate experience. And so from then on, everything became experience-oriented. You experience everything. Look how many times you see the word experience. Now it's not weird to have an experience, a spiritual experience. It doesn't matter how crazy it is. It doesn't matter anymore. If you roll on the floor in the Holy Ghost, that's cool, man. What a trip. Everything is experience. You experience Tide. You experience soap powder. You experience toothpaste. You experience frozen dinners. You experience everything. You don't just do it anymore and eat it anymore and wash with it. You experience everything. You experience this luxury. You experience this trip. You experience this denture powder. You experience everything. Everything has become an experience. So now it, it's not weird. You can go buy crystals and you can hold them up at a certain time. And gather all the sources of the universe and the energy. You know, we're experience oriented now. So, so big deal. You talk in tongues and stagger around on Friday night in your church. Well, that's cool. That's your thing. But we're all experience oriented. The devil would like for you to forget that this world really isn't your home. And he would like for you to forget that the real world will never accept the real church. And the real church will never accept the real world. They'll never be one. They'll never unite. They'll never blend. There'll never even be any gray areas between the real world and the real church. He'd like you to forget that. He'd like for you to forget that God's church is a blood-bought church. And God's going to get it out of this world in just a little while. He'd like for you to forget about heaven because he will never go to heaven. He'll never go to heaven. He'll never be there. He'll never be close to that. The devil would like for you to forget what God has prepared for those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. He would like for you to forget that. I wish I had time to play with this tonight. I have a blast doing it. I love to talk about heaven. I'm going there. You're going there. I love to do it. I have a license to do it because God said eyes have never seen and ears have never heard. Neither has it entered the heart of man. The things plural the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. I can't imagine what He's doing. And He is able by the Holy Ghost, the Bible said, to do exceeding abundantly above all that I could ask or think. So if I can think it, He's doing better. Now He gave me a clue and I'll start there. And then I'll go crazy for a few minutes. John said, first of all, when God gets ready to do this, that the heavens are going to melt with a fervent heat. Now, I understand that you've, we've never experienced any of this before. Never experienced it. It's like the rapture is, is strange to everybody because we have nothing to compare it to. Nothing. We don't know what rapture's like, leaving the ground. We don't know. It's never happened. We don't have anything to compare it to. That's why it's easy to be doubtful about those things and wonder about them because you have absolutely nothing in your mind to compare it to. But the elements, elements, the atoms, the protons, the neutrons, the electrons, all of the building particles of matter as we know it today, God's going to burn all of it. Everything. The moon, the sun, the planets, the universes, the air, the water, 
All of it is going to go. It's going to go. Some people say, well, that must be talking about atomic war. No, because that's all going to. Fervent heat. It's going to be gone. And John in vision said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Because God had said, Behold, I make all, everybody say all, all. things new. So God starts all over after He saves you. Get you up here to His side. He said, Now I'm going to make all things new. Everything burns up. Everything's new. And he said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Woo. And he started trying to describe that. Now, new Jerusalem is just headquarters for all the new stuff God's making. Now, that's not all of heaven. That's not all there is to heaven. God said, I made, John said that there was a new heaven, and that was not God's celestial dwelling place, that was stars and moon and space, and new earth. Right. Going to be another world after this one. New earth. Made it new. It wasn't made out of the same stuff, it's not made out of dirt. Dirt don't exist anymore. It's not, it doesn't have air like we know it. That's, the elements are gone. There's something new. Water. John said that there was no more sea. No more water. That element's gone. God's going to have something that we don't even know what's going to be there. And New Jerusalem is headquarters for all this. Now you measure New Jerusalem and convert it, it's 1,700 miles in all directions. The length is as the breadth as is the height. 1,700 miles long, 1,700 miles wide, 1,700 miles high. 1,700 miles is the distance from here to Houston, Texas. That's just headquarters. Twelve foundations. Some people say layers. I'll buy that. And every layer is built on a different a, a stone, a precious stone. Streets of pure gold. Not going to be any more gold like we know it today. It's pure gold. He said it's so pure it's like glass. So pure there's not even any color in it. Not any gold like we know it today. That's all gone. That's burned and melted with a fervent heat. It's gone. What God's going to make is pure. Because there's nothing in New Jerusalem that defiles. No dirt. No pollution. Nothing that destroys or defiles. This is just headquarters, folks. 1,700 miles. It takes me three days, two nights in a motel to travel from here to Houston, Texas. And the same coming back. What are you going to do when you just want to jump across New Jerusalem to talk to any of your friends? Now, we're not talking about going to the new planets and the new space and the stars and all the new earth that God... We're not talking about going out of the gates of New Jerusalem. We're just talking about going across town. You're going to have three days to get over there and motel trips on the way, 1,700 miles. My girls hope we have wings. We won't have wings. Now, this is going to boggle your mind a little bit. It's Friday night. If you want to go eat, go ahead. I, this is all right. I, I'm going to tell you something that the devil would like for you to forget. Because he'll never see it. He'll never go there. He'll never be there. I'm telling you what God's going to do for you. What you going to do when you want to go across New Jerusalem? Well, now Einstein tapped on it. I, I, he probably just guessed at it, and I think there's a lot to it. Scientists are just kind of skirting the fringes of what God already knows. They say that we use one-tenth of one percent of our brain cells at, while we're thinking at any given time. 
that we never in our most complicated thoughts which with me is pretty constant is never more than one tenth of one percent of your brain the rest stays dormant in a glorified body it's all going to come alive and there's a secret in it the scripture says you shall know even as you are known you wonder how Jesus walked on this earth and knew their thoughts knew what they were thinking stood in a room while Peter was out across town arguing with the IRS Jesus was teaching a Bible study while Peter was arguing with the IRS on the other side of town. Peter comes running back in, running from the IRS, gets in the door, and Jesus says, um, Peter, having some tax problems. And here it goes. And people say, Ooh, what a miracle. Jesus knew all things. Yeah, the Bible said that when we see him, we will be changed and we will be like unto him. Our bodies will be like unto His glorious body. It's all going to come alive. And you're going to know. Einstein said, had a little theory of relativity, and this blows my mind. I, I barely can say the word. Some of you may have studied this and you know about it. Please don't tell me because you'll confuse me if you come after church trying to enlighten me because I, I can hardly handle what little dab I know. But it had something to do with the relation of time and space. That we, we deal with space because of time. It takes me so many minutes to walk from here to here. And I've covered this space in a certain amount of time. And, and time. It takes time to go home. Time to come to church. It takes time to move through space. So he was trying to say that when there's no time, that space changes. Alright, now i got to stop right there and get off because I don't understand anymore. But in a glorified body, 1,700 miles is nothing. You don't go 1,700 miles. You just say, I want to be, boom, you're there. That's why Jesus could meet, eat fish with them on the seashore, disappear suddenly, and reappear in a room. Because in a glorified body, time and space meant nothing to Jesus. That's why they said, we've laid him in a grave for three days. But he was down in another place, setting captives free. Time and space meant nothing to a glorified body. You're going to be made like him. The devil will never know that. He would like for you to forget that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you are going to be changed. <laughs> glorified body. Glorified body. There's going to be something in the New Jerusalem that has been shut out of the lives of men since creation. And that is the tree of life. You study the New Jerusalem and you'll find there the tree of life. That was the tree that God shut Adam and Eve away from with the flaming sword and wouldn't let them partake of it. Because if they ate of the tree of life in a sinful state, they would have stayed sinful as long as they ate it. So God wouldn't let them be eternally sinful. But he got them saved first. And then he says, okay, come on, you can have the tree of life now. Eat and live forever. Now, glorified bodies, and I'm quitting now. Glorified bodies in heaven. There's nothing in heaven that will defile or destroy or cause you to err. Somebody says, I don't know. What if we get to heaven and we mess up? You can't mess up in heaven. There's no devil. There's in all of God's new creation. He promised you there is nothing that will harm or destroy or defile. Nothing. You couldn't think of a bad word if you tried. Let's see. What was that we used to say? You couldn't think of it. If you wanted to, if you wanted to do something just a little bit wicked, and you said, I just feel a little bit, you couldn't think anything. 
Because the devil's not there. There's absolute void when it comes to trying anything evil. There's nothing. You can't mess up. For eternity, you can't mess up. A glorified body. You'll never cough in heaven. <coughs> never. You'll never sweat in heaven. There won't be any sweat in heaven. You won't, I don't know how this is going to work, but you won't be overweight in heaven. <laughs> you will not be aware of the weight on your feet. No gravity. All that's changed. That's all part of this earth. That's all gone, burned up. No gravity. No world spinning, pulling you down. No gravity. No pain. No hurt. No sorrow. No tears. No sickness. Everything's new. Nothing is the same. The devil would like you to forget that. Because he'll never know it. He'll never be there. He won't ever know it. I believe that God has got so many things prepared for us in heaven that we'll never have to do the same thing twice. For eternity, there'll be something for you to do every time you want to do it. And you'll never have to do the same thing twice. Never be bored. Never be tired. Oh, about as close as we can get is sit down by the river and rest a little while. You can do that if you want. I've got stuff to do. <laughs> he said, I'm going to march around the throne 10,000 years. Well, you go ahead and march, babe. I am going somewhere. You say, well, don't you want to stay in the presence of the Lamb of God? I'll always be in His presence. For the Lamb is the light of that place. There's not going to be any shadows there. Because the light of God in heaven is not directional. It does not come from one place and go out. It floods everything. There's never a shadow in heaven. Never. There's nowhere you can go in God's eternity that you won't be bathed and surrounded in God's light. It doesn't come from a sun or a moon. It comes from God. Everywhere you go in eternity, God's with you. All around you. You don't have to march around His throne to be with Him. You can go visit moons and stars and universes. And you can be all over New Jerusalem and never once leave the presence of God. And I'm closing with this statement. A man is a fool if he gives all of that up for anything in this life. If you're not living for God tonight, because of some dumb excuse in this world, you're a fool. If you're not living for God because of suffering that's going on in your body tonight, you don't understand that the apostles told us that one glimpse of Him in glory will make this life seem but a moment. Suffering and pain and heartache and years and years and years of anything when you step foot in glory... It'll be like a moment. A lifetime of cancer and pain and suffering. A moment. Right. Doing without and poverty and, and, and ridicule. A moment. It'll be less than a pinprick. It'll just be, what was that? What was that that just came through? That was life. That was 80 years of life. Oh, yeah, I just barely felt it. Oh, just it's already slipping away from me. It's already vague. I don't, I don't even remember it. It's gone. A moment. But a moment. But a moment. But a moment. Once you get in there and see what God has made for you. You see what God has done. When you see all of that splendor and all of that. It's all but a moment. That's why I beg of you tonight. To get in church. Live for God with all of your heart. Do whatever it takes to be faithful to God. Get all the help you can because it won't be but a moment when He comes back. The Apostle said, as we stand together tonight, the Apostle said, For I reckon that our present suffering is but a moment. 
compared to the glory that awaits us. I reckon that it is but a moment when I see Him. Don't give up God and don't reject heaven for anything in this world. The devil would like for you to forget that all of this is just could be just minutes away that you take one step in the earth and one step in the rapture. He'd like for you to forget that. He'd like for you to forget that this world really is not your home. You really are just passing through. He'd like for you to forget that and get real comfortable and feel like everything centers right here on this world and that the issues of this world are everything and that what you're going through now is just all, all powerfully important. You'll say, oh, but I can't wait to see God. When I see God, I'm going to ask Him about this and I'm going to ask Him about that. No, you won't. When you see God, you won't say a word. You'll fall at His feet as dead. And everything in this life will be but a moment. It'll be gone when you see Him. You just got to get there. You just got to get there. You just got to get there. Oh, hallelujah. You just, you just got to get there. It's just got to work. You just got to get there. I got to read one more scripture. I got to read one more scripture. Now that I've said all of that about heaven. And now the devil comes in and says, Yeah, that all sounds nice, but you ain't there yet. And so we need to sing that old chorus. Not really. But we need to sing, I've got a long way to go. And we need to, now we need to capitalize on how hard it is going to be to get there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I want to read. I want to read in Second Peter chapter 1 that I referred to. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Listen to verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes! You missed that. You do these things and let that process work and you don't have to get to heaven. Heaven comes to you. You don't struggle to the door. Oh God, I gotta make it, just make it inside that gate. Uh Uh-uh. You do these things, and the apostle said, God brings the gate to you. So an entrance shall be ministered unto you. and let heaven come to you. The everlasting kingdom will be ministered to you. God will bring it and put it on you. Let's shout a while.
into heaven. Just do what the Bible tells you to do and heaven will come to you. Heaven will come to you. The everlasting kingdom of God will come to you. Hallelujah. 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 This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I cannot feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful. <laughs>